Well, hello. I'm Wendy Burton. I'm a GP from Brisbane and I'm here with my colleague, Kelly Tatham, who's an obstetrician and gynaecologist. And we're going to talk today about the pelvic floor. So Kelly, would you please help me by defining prolapse? What are the different degrees? Mm -hmm. So the most commonly used uh, classification um, is the one where we learned stage zero, one, two, three, and four prolapse. And I think that's the simplest um, way that a lot of health, health professionals mm -hmm. communicate about prolapse. But we also talk about different compartments. So the anterior compartment being the bladder, um, and when that prolapses, we call it a sister seal. The apical or top compartment uh, being the uh, uterus or cervix and the vagina. Um, and then we also talk about the rectus seal or the posterior compartment. So all three of those things can descend. Um, and we can classify the, all three of those areas as being anywhere between stage one and four. So stage zero means that there really is no movement. Stage one means that there's some descent of those areas down to uh, within one centimetre of the uh, hymenal rem remnant or introitus. Stage two prolapse means that that lowest compartment comes to within minus one centimetre or outside by plus one centimetre. Stage three is protruding more than one centimetre outside of that um, point zero, which is a hymenal remnant, or stage four means complete aversion or prosodenture. Okay, so Kelly, in terms of then um, stage one prolapse, where it's that, that minor degree of descent, when do we make the call? When do we say to women, I mean, it's more obvious to me when we've got physical uh, um, prolapse beyond the introitus, but, but when there's minor, do we do more harm than good is that for controversial? Do we do mm -hmm. more harm than good in mentioning that to women or should we simply be upfront and say you have prolapse? It's a really good question. It's very interesting. Um, I think that most women, whether they are nulliparous or not and whether they've had childbirth or not, most women have some descent of their pelvic organs when you ask them to strain. And our usual way to measure them, the way that you're actually meant to measure them is under anaesthetic and actually putting tension on, on their organs. And every woman that I've ever examined, if I pull on any part of their vaginal area under, under anaesthetic, will have some descent. So I think that every woman physiologically has some descent and that's a good thing. Otherwise we'd have completely rigid vaginas which would be uncomfortable for intercourse and all of the things that, mm -hmm. that we need it to do. Um, so when some woman, when a woman has very minor descent, if it's stage one and it's, it's moving minimally and the woman is asymptomatic, then generally I, I don't bring it up as an issue because I see it as being physiological. When a woman has her cervix or a part of the vagina coming close to the introitus, then I often will bring it up even if they haven't because it's those women who may experience a bulge or a heaviness or some urinary symptoms, so voiding difficulties, need, needing to double void, or um, having to apply pressure on the vaginal area in order to pass urine or defecate. So it's those women who may not have opened up about those symptoms yet that are having descent down to the vaginal opening who I will ask them then, mm -hmm. um, you know, because of this descent, are you having any symptoms? If they are completely asymptomatic, my general advice to them would be to see a physiotherapist and, and avoid the triggers for ongoing pressure on the pelvic floor. So Kelly, uh, what are the risks for uh, women in terms of developing a prolapse? Yeah, so I guess the main risk factors, again, modifiable and non-modifiable, ethnicity and collagen um, are really important. There are women that have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome mm -hmm. who unfortunately have prolapse before any childbirth. Um, however, the most common reasons for women to have prolapse is chronic elevated intra-abdominal pressure. So those women that are obese, um, that have had a history of chronic constipation, um, pregnancy and childbirth is a very important factor, but for most women, just being pregnant can have put uh, pressure on the pelvic floor um, enough to cause some prolapse. Um, certainly having a vaginal delivery or having a complicated vaginal delivery does increase that um, as well. But the main risk factors are cough, obesity, chronic constipation and complicated childbirth. Okay. So Kelly, some women have prolapse but are asymptomatic, mm -hmm. some women have 
very little prolapse, but uh, symptomatic, when should we refer, who do we refer to, what are the resources available? Mm -hmm. So I think that any woman who is symptomatic uh, of their prolapse, whether it, or pelvic floor dysfunction, uh, whether that be urinary incontinence, uh, difficulty voiding, uh, difficulty um, passing stool, or having lump or heaviness, all of those women should be seen by a pelvic floor physiotherapist and have directed uh, physio uh, intervention. Um, for a lot of women with mild uh, or even stage two prolapse, it won't reverse their prolapse, it can't improve their collagen, but it has actually been shown that those women that stick with physio might actually have a reduction in their symptomatology. And for a lot of women that is enough and they don't want any further management. So for those women at least, refer to physio for, for all of them. For women that have um, more significant prolapse or symptoms like difficulty uh, defecating, um, recurrent urinary tract infections or inability to completely empty their bladder, mm -hmm. um, then they should probably be referred to a physio and also a gynaecologist or a uro urogynaecologist in the first instance um, because those women can obviously become quite unwell. Um, women with prosodentia um, can have bleeding and rubbing and excoriation, it's very painful, um, and as well can um, get hydrourea and uh, urosepsis. That's the you know end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. but women can get quite unwell. The vast majority, however, may be asymptomatic, um, and I reassure them that nothing surgical has to be done for them, and if it becomes symptomatic, then they let me know at that point mm -hmm. when it's a bother. For most women, a little bit of pelvic floor physio might be effective. Stepping up from that um, as a conservative management would be uh, mentioning to them that uh, uh, there is the option of pessary use and a lot of the pelvic floor physios uh, locally um, are trained um, in pessary use and often uh, talk to gynaecologists in, in what they uh, keep us in the loop with what they're doing and how they're managing that. Only a small proportion of the women who are uh, symptomatic will absolutely need to go on and have surgery. And when they're talking about surgery, many women are fearful of the mesh debate currently. And I reassure them that for most women, especially those women who have never had surgery before on the pelvic floor, that it is likely that their operation is not going to need um, or require mesh in the first instance. Mm -hmm. Kelly, for the woman who's six weeks postpartum, who's concerned, who's got some symptoms and who does have uh, some prolapse, is there any other advice, any other suggestions that you would make to her? Yes. At six weeks postpartum, uh, women's bodies are not quite back to pre-pregnancy uh, state. So they're very low in estrogen. Um, they're still recovering from any tears that they've had. Their pelvic floor muscles are not as, you know, not optimal as yet. And so it is very common at six weeks postpartum, if you were to perform a speculum exam, that some of them do have up to stage two prolapse. A lot of them are asymptomatic for this, um, and I will mention it to them if they are symptomatic. And in that instance, I, I mentioned that it is actually normal at, at six weeks for 50% of them to have up to a second degree prolapse. And I encourage them to engage with a pelvic floor physio to avoid the chronic um, high intensity training um, you know, at six weeks postpartum. And I reassure them that most of them by the six months or by the time that they finish breastfeeding will be completely asymptomatic and no longer have a stage two prolapse. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So Kelly, you talked before about modifiable risk factors and obviously we can encourage women to have a healthy body weight. We can encourage them uh, to manage constipation. Mm -hmm. We can encourage our smokers to quit and our asthmatics to have good control. Um, but are there any other things from a prevention perspective for women who are considering their, their options going forward? Complicated childbirth, who gets to choose? Yeah, good question. So there are some uh, prediction models uh, that are available now um, that may be useful for women who are concerned about sustaining pelvic floor dysfunction later in life, uh, who are pregnant. Um, and easily available on the internet under your choice. So you are hyphen choice. Um, and what that looks at are the risk factors for each woman um, for developing pelvic floor, any pelvic floor dysfunction at 12 and 20 years postpartum. So we know that the woman who is um, age 40 um, with a high BMI and a large for gestational age infant 
is well and truly going to be in the higher risk range. And what this model does is look at well, what is the risk of having bothersome symptoms or requiring treatment for urine incontinence, fecal incontinence or prolapse at 12 and 20 years in the general population and what is this woman's risk based on her risk factors. So if she is actually higher than the general population risk, she has a choice. You know, she may decide that for her, she'd like to have a cesarean section. What the prediction tool does, however, is it does break it down into what is her risk if she has a vaginal birth versus Caesar. So we know that cesarean section is more protective against urine incontinence, followed by pelvic organ prolapse, followed by fecal incontinence, but it is not 100% protective for any of those things. So you can still develop all of those things despite having all cesarean births. And so it's really important to put that into context. So when it comes to, for the, for the woman that then decides that yes, okay, well I'm going to have a vaginal birth, um, it's about avoiding the large for gestational age infant and either inducing early um, or offering a cesarean section in that instance about antenatal perineal massage, um, intrapartum perineal massage and, and those sorts of things and for afterwards engaging with a pelvic floor physio so that they have the skills to turn on and engage their pelvic floor um, when they're um, coughing and exercising and lifting their baby and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Kelly, thank you so very much. No worries.